50 years ago, when the WWF was founded, there were about 3 billion people on Earth. Now, there are almost 7 billion, over twice as many, and every one of them needing space. Space for their homes, space to grow their food, or get others to grow it for them, space to build schools and roads and airfields. Where could that come from? A little might be taken from land occupied by other people, but most of it could only come from the land which, for millions of years, animals and plants had had to themselves, the natural world. But the impact of these extra millions of people has spread far beyond the space that they physically claimed. The spread of industrialization has changed the chemical consistency of the atmosphere. The oceans that cover most of the surface of the planet have been polluted and increasingly acidified. And the Earth is warming. We now realize that the disasters that continue increasingly to afflict the natural world have one element that connects them all. The unprecedented increase in the number of human beings on the planet. There have been prophets who've warned us of this impending disaster, of course. One of the first was Thomas Malthus. His most important book, an essay of the principle of population, was published over 200 years ago in 1798. In it, he argued that the human population would increase inexorably until it was halted by what he called misery and vice. Today, for some reason, that prophecy seems to be largely ignored or at any rate disregarded. It's true that he did not foresee the so-called Green Revolution, which greatly increased the amount of food that can be produced in any given area of arable land. And there may be other advances in our food producing skills that we ourselves still can't foresee. But such advances only delay things. The fundamental truth that Malthus proclaimed remains the truth. There cannot be more people on this earth than can be fed. Many people would like to deny that this is so. They would like to believe in that oxymoron, sustainable growth. Kenneth Boulding, President Kennedy's environmental advisor 45 years ago, said something about this. Anyone who believes in indefinite growth in anything physical on a physically finite planet, he said, is either mad or an economist. <laughs> the population of the world is now growing by nearly 80 million a year, one and a half million a week, a quarter of a million a day, 10,000 an hour growing. In this country, it's projected to grow by 10 million in the next 22 years. All these people in this country and worldwide, rich or poor, need and deserve food, water, energy, and space. Will they be able to get it? I don't know. I hope so. You may have seen the government's foresight report on the future of food and palming. It shows how hard it is to feed the seven billion of us who are alive today. It is the many obstacles that are already making this harder to achieve. Soil erosion, salinization, the depletion of aquifers, overgrazing, the speed of plant diseases as a result of globalization, the absurd growing of food crops to turn into biofuels to feed motor cars instead of people, and so on. So it underlines how desperately difficult it's going to be to feed a population that is projected to stabilize in the range of 8 to 10 billion people by the year 2050. It recommends the widest possible range of measures across all disciplines to tackle this. And it makes a number of eminently sensible recommendations, including a second green revolution. But surprisingly, there are some things that the report does not say. It doesn't state the obvious fact that it would be much easier to feed 8 billion people than 10. 
nor does it suggest that the measures to achieve such a number, such as family planning and the education and empowerment of women, should be a central part of any program that aims to secure an adequate food supply for humanity. It doesn't refer to the prescient statement 40 years ago by Norman Borlaug, the Nobel laureate and father of the first Green Revolution. He produced new strains of high-yielding, short-straw, disease-resistant wheat, and in doing so saved thousands of people in India, Pakistan, Africa, and Mexico from starvation. But he warned us that all he had done was to give us a breathing space in which to stabilize our numbers. The government's report anticipates that food prices may well rise with oil prices and makes it clear that this will affect poorest people worst and discusses various ways to help them. But it doesn't mention what every mother subsisting on the equivalent of a dollar a day already knows, that her children would be better fed if there were four of them around the table instead of ten. These are strange omissions. Another impressive government report on biodiversity published this year, Making Space for Nature in a Changing World, is rather similar. It discusses all the rising pressures on wildlife in the United Kingdom, but it doesn't mention our growing population as being one of them, which is particularly odd when you consider that Europe, England rather, is already the most densely populated country in Europe. Most bizarre of all was a recent report by a Royal Commission on the Environmental Impact of Demographic Change in this country, which denied that population size was a problem at all, as though 20 million extra people, more or less, would have no real impact. Of course, it's not our only or even our main environmental problem, but it's absurd to deny that, as a multiplier of all the others, it is a problem. I suspect that you could read a score of reports by bodies concerned with global problems and see that population is clearly one of the drivers that underlies them all, and yet find no reference to this obvious fact in any of them. Climate change tops the environmental agenda at present. We all know that every additional person will need to use some carbon energy, if only for firewood for cooking, and will therefore create more carbon dioxide, though, of course, a rich person will produce vastly more than a poor one. Similarly, we can all see that every extra person is or will an extra victim of climate change, though the poor will undoubtedly suffer more than the rich. Yet not a word of it appeared in the voluminous documents emerging from the Copenhagen and Cancun climate summits. Why this strange silence? I meet no one who privately disagrees that population growth is a problem. No one, except flat earthers, can deny that that planet is finite. We can all see it in that beautiful picture from our Earth, of our Earth taken from the Apollo mission. It remains an obvious and brutal fact that on a finite planet, human populations will quite definitely stop at some point. And that can only happen in one of two ways. It can happen sooner by fewer human births, in a word, by contraception. That's the humane way, the powerful option which allows all of us to deal with the problem if we collectively choose to do so. The alternative is an increased death rate the way in which all other creatures must suffer through famine or disease or predation. That, translated into human terms, means famine or disease or war over oil or water or food or minerals or grazing rights or just living space. There is, alas, no third alternative of indefinite growth. The sooner we stabilize our numbers, the sooner we stop running up the down escalator. Stop population increase, stop the escalator, and we have some chance of reaching the top. That's to say, a decent life for all. To do that, 
requires several things. 